Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we're opening up an old AMD wound by revisiting the FX8350 and we will be comparing it to probably the most legendary CPU to be released in the past decade, the Core i7-2600K. Not that long ago we did revisit the 2600K and found that the performance of the now 7 year old CPU was very respectable. Although it did trail the latest and greatest 8th generation 8700K by a reasonable margin when using an extreme gaming GPU such as the GTX 1080 Ti, with a GTX 1070 or something even slower, the margin was minimal. Therefore, I concluded that if you currently own a 2600K and you are willing to overclock it, chances are upgrading to an 8th gen core processor won't net you much in the way of extra performance, at least for gaming. But before we get too far into the comparison, sponsoring today's video is Hilo, and I greatly appreciate their support. If you're after a respectable broker to trade with, I suggest checking out Hilo. Registered since 2010, Hilo is a trusted and regulated brand. In fact, it's one of the few Australian binary trading platforms to hold an Australian financial services license. They offer industry high payouts with easy bonus terms, as well as payouts up to 200% on initial investment quickly and securely. With Hilo, you can withdraw funds quickly and easily using a range of methods without any hidden terms. You can also trade on the go with Hilo iOS and Android apps. Hilo also offers one of the easiest to access demo accounts I've ever seen. Simply click the demo button and you're away. You don't have to deposit, you don't even have to give them your email address. Just click the quick demo link and you'll get $10,000 worth of virtual money to play with. Moreover, if you sign up today, Hilo is offering the first 50 viewers an additional $50, so $100 on total, and this offer is available for the next four days. So click the link in the video description and check them out. Right, so when compared to the recent 2600K revisit, the situation with the FX8350 might be a little different. Despite packing more cores, IPC performance is down and power consumption is way up. This has always been the problem of AMD's bulldozer architecture, and 2012's update codename Vashera featuring pile driver cores didn't solve this. I concluded my review back in October of 2012 by saying this. With AMD's aggressive pricing, the updated FX series isn't necessarily in an indefensible position against Ivy Bridge when purely comparing speed and price, but it's not exactly an open and shut case either. The FX 6300 might offer 22% more performance than the Core i3-3220 for about the same price, but our pile driver powered test rig also consumed 86% more power than the Ivy Bridge machine, 227 watts versus 116 watts. The bottom line is that the Pile Driver FX series provides a quick, affordable upgrade for folks still using lower end K10 hardware. But there isn't a lot to see for those running high end Phenom 2 X4 and X6 processors, regardless of how cheap the new parts might be. For those building a fresh rig from scratch, Ivy Bridge will likely still be more attractive thanks to its superior single thread performance and efficiency. So, almost five and a half years later, here we are. Games no longer use just two cores, and in fact we're starting to see quad cores going out of fashion at the high end. So while the Core i3-3220 might have kept up with the 8-core FX8350 back then, it would likely struggle today. Still, a 55-watt part is hardly sport for the mighty 125-watt FX processor, so we're putting it up against the much older 95-watt 2600K. The following benchmarks have been conducted with the Core i7-2600K clocked at 4.8GHz using DDR3-2133 memory. Then we have the FX8350 clocked slightly lower at 4.7GHz, but that's as high as I could get it, and I don't expect that 2% difference in clock speed will amount to much. The FX process has been paired with faster DDR3-2400 memory, so that should well and truly make up for the clock speed deficit. Finally, both the Hyper Transport Link and Northbridge frequency were overclocked to 2.6 GHz. For testing, we have almost a dozen games that were benchmarked at a range of settings and resolutions using the GTX 1080 Ti, so without wasting any more time, let's get to the results. Like all good benchmark sessions, we're starting with Ashes of the Benchmark, and here we see the FX8350 isn't able to get anywhere near the most out of the GTX 1080 Ti, limiting performance to around 70 FPS on average. This means best case the FX processor was 16% slower than the 2600K and this margin can be seen at 1440p when comparing the average frame rate. That said though it was just 8% slower for the 1% low result under this GPU constrained test condition. If we unleash the GTX 1080 Ti with the medium quality settings at 1080p, the FX8350 is now almost 30% slower for both the 1% low and average frame rate. 
or you could state it by saying that the 2600K was 40% faster, but that just sounds worse. Either way, in this heavily threaded title, a 2600K appears to be vastly superior. Next up, we have a game that's been putting torrent sites out of business. That was until it was recently cracked. I am, of course, talking about Assassin's Creed Origins and its DRM for days. Here we see that the ultra quality settings were a bit taxing on the bulldozer processor, and while it did keep frame rates above 30 FPS at all times, it was noticeably laggy when compared to the 2600K. The high quality settings did allow for much smoother performance, though it was interesting to see that downgrading to the medium quality settings didn't really improve things. Basically, when GPU limited at 1440p, the FX8350 was still 14% slower on average and 33% slower for the 1% low result, so a very comfortable win for the Sandy Bridge processor. Moving on, we have some Battlefield 1 single player results, and yes, we are testing the single player as it's impossible to accurately measure multiplayer performance. We can get a rough idea, but it's really not the most accurate test as I can't control what the other 60 plus players do, and you won't believe how many times people from both sides completely disobey my benchmark orders. So the single player results will have to do. Here the 2600K was 30 to 35% faster for the high and medium quality tests, and even at 1440p with the ultra quality settings, the FX8350 was still around 20% slower than Intel's old quad core. The FX8350 does quite well on Call of Duty World War II, despite trailing the 2600K by a reasonable margin, and by this I mean the resulting performance was very playable. Interestingly, even at 1440p, the FX8350 was still 23% slower for the average frame rate, though it was only 13% slower for the 1% low result. But I'm not quite sure why I'm saying only, as that is still a decent margin. Moving on, we have Dawn of War 3, and golly gosh, what's going on here then? And I'm not talking about that delightfully elegant expression. Previously, when comparing the 2600K to the 8700K, we did find that the older Sandy Bridge CPU was almost 30% slower in this title, and that was one of its worst losses. Despite that, though, the 2600K was still 56% faster than the FX8350, and that almost shouldn't be possible. Dawn of War 3 clearly isn't optimized in any shape or form for the bulldozer architecture. If you're wondering why the frame rate doesn't change between the various quality settings and resolutions, even with the 2600K, the answer is simple. We're extremely CPU limited in this title, even at 4.8 gigahertz. Next up, we have Dirt 4, and this is a relatively harmless title. It's been helping budget CPUs and GPUs feel good about themselves since June 2017. We see that even at 1440p, it caresses the FX8350 along, allowing for a minimum of 60 FPS. In fact, as we continue to become more and more GPU bound, the 1% low figures start to align. The same though can't be said for the average frame rate. Looking at the average frame rate, the FX8350 was incredibly 34% slower at 1440p and 45% slower at 1080p. So while the FX processor was able to deliver playable performance, the 2600K was just on another level. This would probably be surprising if I hadn't actually tested the game with the FX series when it was first released last year. Still, it is surprising in the sense that the Ryzen CPUs perform so well in this title, though I probably shouldn't compare the FX and Ryzen series as they're in no way interchangeable. Moving on from Dirt 4, we have another racing title, and again, things move fast when powered by the 2600K. Again, although the FX8350 was able to deliver playable performance, it was still up to 24% slower at 1440p. However, at 1080p, the margins were often around 30%, as in the FX8350 was 30% slower. So again, we see another title where the older 2600K is just on another level. The last racing title tested is Project Cars 2, and as we found numerous times already, the FX8350 was up to 30% slower. Or, you could say at 1440p, when comparing the average frame rate, the 2600K was 43% faster. 43%. That's clearly a very significant margin. Moving on, things do look much more competitive when testing with Rainbow Six Siege. In fact, at 1440p, things manage to almost come together. Yes, I know we are heavily GPU limited here, but by Joe, I'll take it at this point. At 1080p, using the ultra quality settings, the FX processor was up to 20% slower, but still, this is one of the better results we've seen. Capping the benchmark session off, we have Total War Warhammer 2, and again, at 1440p, the FX8350 is afforded the ability to catch up. Here, it's just 7% slower. That said, at 1080p, using the ultra quality settings, it's now 16% slower and 23% slower at high. I'd say that went pretty much as most of you would have expected. That seemed to be a one-sided beatdown, and the older 2600K was swinging the hammer. 
But to be sure, let's quickly check out the results across the 10 games tested to give us a clear picture of how the battle unfolded. Well, things honestly look very much how I imagined it. Uh, the FX8350 was 19% slower at 1440p using the ultra quality settings, 16% slower if we focus on the 1% low result. It might interest you to know that the 2600K was just 10% slower than the 8th generation Core i7-8700K for the average frame rate under the same test conditions and 17% slower for the 1% low result. So this means the 2600K is closer to the 8700K in terms of gaming performance than the FX8350 is to the 2600K. Now that's just mind blowing. Getting back to these results though, we see when using the ultra quality type settings at 1080p, the FX8350 is 26% slower on average and 21% slower for the 1% low result. These margins continue to grow as we reduce the quality settings, but I imagine you've probably heard enough at this point. Okay, so I'm sure you get it at this point. Even after all these years, the FX8350 is much slower than the Core i7-2600K in most titles. And if you follow a lot of modern game benchmarks, it's probably not a real surprise. That said, let's address a few things that might be upsetting some FX owners who view this video as just another chance to rag on the FX series. Although much slower in the vast majority of tests, the FX8350 did almost always deliver perfectly playable performance. So there is that. I often upset FX owners when I express my honest opinion about the FX series, that being that I believe it's complete garbage. I always give my honest opinion though about everything, whether that be Intel's hot and overpriced Skylake like X-Range or Nvidia's stupidly named Titan X Little P. If you're a regular viewer, you'll know that the list just goes on. Anyway, I appreciate that the FX series was cheap, or at least it was discounted to become very cheap. The FX8150, that landed at $250 US, and most were like, mm. Then a year later, the FX8350 landed at $195 US, and most were like, uh... But eventually, they started going on sale for $150 to $160 US, and in early 2017, we're often selling as low as $130, maybe even $110 US. At that price, the 8-core CPUs tempted some, though I recommended viewers who were predominantly gaming pick up something like a Core i3-6100 instead, and upgrade later on. Or alternatively, as the evidence suggests, you'd be better off buying a second-hand Sandy Bridge, Ivory Bridge, or even a Haswell system. That said, I would just like to note that for certain productivity workloads, the FX8350 does offer a reasonably good bang for your buck, but it is very application dependent and power consumption is still going to be uh, insane. <laughs> Something we'll look at in a moment. Of course, now with Ryzen on the scene, you'd be absolutely mad to ever buy an FX processor for productivity work. A Ryzen is genuinely good and a great value choice for gaming and productivity tasks. Getting back to gaming, many will argue that when paired with a mid-range or low-end GPU, the FX8350 or any of its bulldozer relatives are perfect, as they are cheap and provide playable performance. It's my opinion though that they're not. In fact, they're a terrible pairing with a low-end graphics card because while your RX 560 is just sipping power, the FX processor is guzzling it like a drunken Viking. This ultimately is the real problem with the FX8350 and the entire FX series. If it offered the same performance per watt as the 2600K or was even in the same ballpark, then I might turn a blind eye to the lackluster performance. The problem though is this. Playing Ashes of the Singularity at 1080p using the crazy preset, the FX8350 was 22% slower, and that's no small margin. However, in order to deliver that lackluster performance, it guzzled considerably more power, pushing total system usage 25% higher. So that's 22% less performance while consuming 25% more power, and that right there is why the FX series was the biggest disaster in AMD's history, and remember, the 2600K was released almost two years before the FX8350. Not only that, but this is total system consumption with an extreme 250 watt TDP graphics card. With an RX 560, for example, that percentage margin will grow considerably. So what about application performance? Is the FX series more efficient there? In a word, no. Running the Cinebench R15 multi-threaded test, we saw the FX8350 push system consumption almost 60% higher. 60% higher. You might be thinking, but with those eight cores, it probably scored higher, right? Well, if you thought that, you'd be wrong. The 2600K produced a score of 832 points, making it 15% faster. 
Honestly, the Cinebench R15 test combined with a power readout really tells you all you need to know about this comparison. Those power consumption figures were taken with both CPUs overclocked, but don't think the FX series is far less efficient once overclocked. Uh, stock you'll still see total system consumption around 60% higher with the FX processor. So to recap, my problem with the FX series isn't just that it's slower, it's that it's slower and consumes significantly more power. And let's be honest, that's certainly not a good thing, and ultimately it led to the FX series being a complete and utter failure for AMD. On that cheerful note, that's going to do it for this one. Again, I'd like to thank Hilo for supporting our work. It's been great to be able to partner with them on this one. Don't forget to check out Hilo by using the link in the video description. Remember, the first 50 viewers to sign up and contact Hilo support with the code HILO 50 extra 4 within the first four days of this video going live will get an additional $50. So what are you waiting for? Go sign up. And finally, thanks for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you again soon.